scripture readings this morning in Genesis chapter 28. So we're learning about the patriarchs. And so here we are with Isaac and his sons, Jacob especially, and Esau. Beginning at verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven." So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And then from Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. i got to see how far I go. <laughs> and if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. And then skipping to verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And finally, from 1 Kings chapter 3, this young king has a prayer, and God answers, beginning in verse 5. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, although I am only a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, 
because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before, and no one like you shall rise after you. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When I use the term sovereign God, when we say God is omniscient, omnipresent, God is beyond our knowing, God is a mystery, we pause in wonder. When members of this congregation cannot explain how they know God, but they do, they believe, they have faith, we are lifted to the realm of mystery and wonder that is countercultural to our day. Because we live in a modern society that expects us to master the facts, fix everything. We humans, after the Enlightenment, began to believe that we have everything that we need right at our fingertips. We just need to work harder, do more, explore more, think more. And what about God? Well, in the way of thinking in our society today in America, God is not needed. God is irrelevant. And for some Christians in our time, we are trying to package God as a commodity because that's what we're in, right? We're selling things. We have to have more, do more. And so we package this God in a box. And when we explain God, we define God, we master God. And the church Well, once upon a time, we think that the church was at the center of American society. And now the church has been sidelined. And some of us grieve for the way the church used to be. We want to do everything in our power to make our churches survive. Because if we don't have children in our churches, if we don't have young parents, our children or our churches will be gone in a decade or less. And we remember John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the church that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God did not send his son into the church to condemn the church, but that the church might be saved through him. You cut that, didn't it? It's not about the church. It's about the world. God came in the form of the son Not to save the church, but to save the world. So how will you and I discern for our individual lives and for our church, our precious Eastwood church, how will we learn? How will we learn what God wills? How will we let God break into our world, our lives, our church, and do the transforming work that God loves to do? Where God's fire burns in our hearts. So this morning we look to scripture for some clues. We join me in prayer. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Oh Lord, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. So we begin with the story of Jacob, the younger twin of the brother Esau. Jacob had stayed close to his mother Rebekah during his growing up years. He was her favorite son. He helped around the tent. He could cook. Even though he was the second son and beloved, It was the birthright and blessing that belonged to his older brother Esau. That meant that his brother Esau would always have the final word over his life. Esau's story would lead the story of their family. But Esau makes a stupid mistake one day. 
He comes in the from the fields when he is absolutely starving, and he sells his birthright for a pot of pottage, stew, porridge. And he can't really mean it, but gets Jacob thinking. And so he and his mother, Rebecca, hatch up a plan to actually steal the birthright from Esau. They convince their father, Isaac, with a sensory lie to give the final blessing to Jacob. And they pull it off. And Esau finds out, and he's fit to be tied. More than that, he wants to kill his brother. And so Jacob, with the blessing of his parents, flees to Haran and his uncle Laban's household. And on the way, you heard it, he uses a stone as a pillow as he beds down for the night. And in a dream, the barrier between earth and heaven is broken, and there is a stairway where angels are going up and down, and the Lord God of Abraham stands beside him and confirms that the blessing given to Abraham and Isaac is now extended to Jacob. He will be the father of a great nation. So this despairing, disobedient, deceitful, fleeing man who probably feels like he's lost everything is given the promise of everything. And when he awakes, he knows the fear of the Lord, which is a wonderful thing to know. And he states, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And Jacob pledges to commit that place, his life, and one-tenth of everything he ever owns to God. His life is changed because of a dream. And Jacob's life will be full of surprises all the way to the end when he is reunited with his beloved son, Joseph, in Egypt, where he will die. And God will change his name to Israel, which means one for whom God prevails with one who struggles with God. And God wins. Because Jacob was determined to take life into his own hands, to try and set his course for life. But God had another plan. And Israel would become the father of the 12 tribes of Israel setting up the formula for the 12 disciples. What a relief for Jacob to be delivered from his plan and to be swept into God's plan for his life. Does God have a plan for your life? Does God have a plan for every single life? For every single person that went to the Mariners game last night or went to Taylor Swift's concert last night in Seattle? Yes, yes. And Psalm 139, written by King David, Solomon's dad, seems to say yes. David knows this reality to be true. And I learned it myself when I was 13 years of age at church camp on camp, at Camp Moran and morning devotions on Orcas Island. I was at church camp sponsored by the Reformed Church of America in the classes of the northwest portion of the state. As I read this psalm in the early morning, I was overcome by the fact that God knew me and had made me. And I was wonderful and fearful that God knew me inside and out. God knew my thoughts. Even when I, at 13, I didn't know who I was but that God had a plan for me. That was an amazing gift. So if you're human, God knows you and God sees you and God desires to be present to you. And the question is, will you be present to this God? When, at, about, when I was about the same age, my dad and leaders in the Presbytery of Olympia were involved with a national campaign called I found it. There were bumper stickers, bulletin boards along I-5, tracks, and evangelistic efforts organized across our whole country. The campaign was sponsored by Campus Crusade for Christ, which is now called Crew. And by the way, 
After great discernment, the leadership of Crew decided to invite me to be the very first woman preacher to teach the Bible on the stage for Crew in Colorado Spring, in Fort Collins in the summer of 2017. 5,000 people listened to a woman preacher and the ceiling of the stadium did not fall down. <laughs> now, did it cause some trouble having a woman on stage? Yes, it did in the long run for a crew. But as they, that organization has dealt with a number of issues in our society, all the talk says that uh, Pastor Joyce Emery stayed true to the word of God, amen. <laughs> the I Found It campaign, the purpose was to introduce America to it, Jesus the Christ. And this campaign may have worked for some, but the whole point of salvation is to let God find you. To let God meet you in the deepest parts of your soul. And to let God pour out upon you the promises of God that draw you into the practices of the kingdom of heaven. God found a despairing Jacob on a dream-filled night at Bethel. Will you let God find you. King Solomon had seen the profound witness of a father David whose life was consumed by the presence of God. And when David sinned, and David sinned mightily, God forgave him. And there were consequences for his sinful actions. But God always brought this beloved father back into God's fold. And Solomon knew this and saw it firsthand. And when he became king at a young age, he knew he could not rule without God's wisdom moving all around him. So in a dream, he asked for wisdom. And God grants that wisdom and more. I've talked in other sermons about how Solomon was respected across all of the Middle East and into Africa. Because he was so blessed by God's wisdom that people knew that in his presence they could find God's will. There's a book about the language of discernment. It's called Discerning God's Will Together, A Spiritual Practice for the Church, written by Danny Morris and Charles Olson. And from that book I quote, When people see God's will, their quest leads them to yearn for the will of God even as God in love yearns for them. Yearning may be a softer word than will and may have more meaning for us. God's will and God's yearning are synonymous. God's will is the best thing that can happen to us under any circumstances. Responding to God's yearning produces harmony, not hardship, and power, not problems. There is a workbook I've put out on the table that is a workbook for those who are working on individual discernment in, your, in their lives. If you would like to take a book this morning, please do and use it. I don't know about you, but I yearn for God's will in my life. And I yearn for God's will in this church and in the world. For you see, discernment distinguishes from the real and the phony, the true and the false, the good and the evil the path toward God and the path away from God. Spiritual discernment sees reality from God's perspective. It is sight from the outside in, and it gives us a vision to see God's will and God's way. And then it calls us to a commitment. I am very uh, well-versed in making decisions with Robert's rules of order. I know how to call for a motion, have it seconded, clarify the motion, have discussion, and call for the question. I can do this. I don't really like it, but I can do it. I love to discern God's will and way with others. And so just briefly, at the end of the sermon, I'd like to review with you the stepping stones of discernment that are practiced by individuals, but even better by churches, leaders, elders, and deacons. 
These steps or movements, we call them, have been defined across the centuries by the church, especially the followers of Ignatius of Antioch, who in the 1500s founded the order of the Jesuits in the Roman Catholic Church. And the Quakers are really good at this. Presbyterians, yes, we can do it. And the process is done in community. It's powerful to do it in our families, and it's amazing to do it in our church because God is yearning. God is always desiring to lead us. So it starts first with framing a question, creating a question that has a yes or a no. We can do this together. And then we ground ourselves in what that question means in our life and our context. And we ground all of this in prayer, seeking God's guidance as we move through this, these steps. And then we're honest about shedding all of the prejudices, the fears that we have. We name them before each other as we move through this step. And then we root ourselves in scripture, in the, our tradition. We learn about when people have dealt with things like this before. And then we begin to listen for where God is speaking from people around us, from the community, from the church. We listen. And then we begin to hear that there are several options before us, and we begin to explore them and think about them. And then we choose one or two, and then we decide upon it, we name it, and then we begin to improve it, making sure we are very clear about where we're going to go and what we're going to do. As we look at each choice that seems to be before us, then we weigh the options and think about what will be the ramifications if we go this way or this way. And then in prayer together, we make a decision and we close the process and we rest in the decision. And if we find peace in that decision, we know that this is God's will for us. If we do not have peace, we step back and go back again and reframe and move through the process again. This is not rocket science. This is something that I hear you doing all the time, but this is a clear stepping, these are clear stepping stones for this process as we seek God's will. And then once we decide, we act. John Calvin who is the father of this family of the Reformed tradition, had a symbol, an emblem, that was a flame burning in an outstretched hand. It bore the motto, Cor meam quasi immolotum tibi affero domine. My heart is as if a flame, and I offer it to you, O Lord. And Calvin said of the Holy Spirit, may it be persistently boiling and burning up our vicious and inordinate desires. And may this same Holy Spirit inflame our hearts with the love of God and with zealous devotion. Calvin, John Calvin was a lawyer, a systematic theolo theologian. He's often accused of being cold and not interested in the Spirit, but he was. He wanted his followers those who followed Jesus, to yearn after the very will of God so that it would burn in them and give them passion. And so my prayer is that our hearts will be aflame as we seek the will of God together, not for ourselves, not to survive, but to be for the world a witness because God loves the world so much that God sent the Son, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We must never forget that God's love is for the world. Amen and amen.